This class will be concerned with student's t distribution. Now let's start by looking at a normal distribution, this bell-shaped uh, distribution. We can see it's symmetric about the uh, vertical axis, which is drawn at zero. Uh, so if we fold it over, if we fold over the, the curve around the that zero axis, it'll fall on top of itself. It'll, it'll precisely trace out. So it's symmetric. And according to, as we'll see later, according to the central limit theorem, um, providing there's no bias in the system, the random selection of objects tends to follow that type of uh, distribution. Uh, if we consider even populations, total populations, then the top populations tend to be distributed in this manner. So for example, if, if we consider the, the heights of people, people say over, uh, over 25, uh, so people over 25 years of age, uh, you will find some people are somewhat short, some people are medium, some people are tall. Um, and that's what we'd expect to find. And if we look at the distribution, it suggests that some people will be quite short, some people, the majority will be around an average, and then we'll have some people who are very tall, way above the average. So that zero line is our average. And we measure uh, movements away from that line in standard deviations. And I've marked out here three standard deviations either side of the line. So I've got standard deviations 1, 2, and 3. And on the other side, minus 1, minus 2, and minus 3. And these are measurements from the average. Now, the interesting thing about these standard deviation measurements, we take a standard deviation of the data, that if we take one standard deviation on either side of the mean, we get about 68.2% of the population will fall inside that area. If we can just put the cursor onto the screen for a moment. Here we go. Um, inside this area here, if we measure this area, we get 68.2% of the area is in here. It's one standard deviation on either side of the mean. And that's significant because now if we know what the, um, what the distribution is and we can measure a standard deviation, then we're confident that 68% of the observations fall within plus or minus one standard deviation of the mean. So we're starting to assign probability here. We're, we're talking now about 68% of the population falling within that range. Um, sorry, we, we could we could do um, three standard deviations either side of the mean, in which case we're almost certain that the almost the whole population lies within those three standard deviations either side of the mean. So if we can work out the standard deviation of the distribution and we work out the, the average, then we could work out that three standard deviations either side of the average will be 99.7%, almost 100% of the population fall in there. It won't be 100 because actually this curve does not touch the axis. This curve is asymptotic, we say, to the axis. It approaches the axis continuously, but never actually touches. Now, student's t distribution. This is the probability distribution that is used to estimate population parameters when the population size is small and or when the population variance is unknown. Sometimes we don't know what the the parameters of the population are. We don't know the variance. 
we don't know what the how how the population is spread out. Sometimes we have to work with small distributions, or small samples, perhaps uh, from a large distribution. We have to pick a small sample because perhaps we haven't got sufficient resources to pick a large sample, or or sometimes we simply can't pick a large sample for technical reasons. For example, let's say we're testing the uh, durability or the the lifetime span of of a light bulb. We can't test all the light bulbs to see how long they're going to last before they're sold. Because if we did, we'd have nothing to sell. All the bulbs would have gone. So what we do is we take a sample. The bigger the sample, if it's taken randomly, of course, the better the approximation will be to the, the true population uh, statistic. True, true population average, let's say. The smaller the sample, the more unreliable it is. A company making uh, electric light bulbs, if it takes a sample size of 10 and it's producing thousands every day, uh, 10 is an insignificant number. Uh, it can't therefore validly say that the, the chances are that the whole batch of light bulbs, the thousands that are produced in a given day, will have certain characteristics. Because working on a sample that small is unreliable. So we use what's known as student's t distribution. Now, why why use the student t distribution? Well, according to the central limit theorem, the sampling distribution of a statistic, for example, like the, the sample mean, will follow a normal distribution as long as the sample size is sufficiently large. Also, of course, the sampling uh, distribution will have to be properly carried out. It will have to be randomly sampled. There can't be bias or distortion in the selection of the sample. Therefore, when we know the standard deviation of the population, we can compute a z-score, or as, as American people say, a z-score. We can use the z-score uh, in terms of the normal distribution to evaluate probabilities with the sample mean. So what we do now is we convert the information that we have picked up in our sample, we convert it to calculate this z-score. And we use the z-score to make predictions about the population. We'll see how it works uh, later. But sample sizes are sometimes small. And also, we may not know the standard deviation of the population. So there we've got a problem. And this is why the, the t distribution is so important, because it enables us to use small sample sizes. And um, also, we can have a good estimate of the likely characteristics of the population based on the t, st uh, t statistic. When either of these problems occur, statisticians rely on the distribution of the t statistic, also known as the t score, whose values are given by that formula. So we say t is equal to x minus mu all over s divided by the root of n, the square root of n. And we'll see how this formula works out in a second. I'm not going to deal with it straight away, but le let's just um, explain the terms. Uh, x is the sample mean, so if we take a sample, then x will be the sample mean. Mu is the population mean. As I said, sometimes we don't know what that is. We don't know uh, what the population mean is. If the population is electric light bulbs coming out of a factory, we don't know what the true population of the mean is, uh, the population statistic. For example, we don't know that the light bulbs are going to last so many hours. The manufacturers have to make this claim 
because they're trying to sell the light bulbs. But that claim is based on probability. But if we did know what the, the true population mean was, that would be mu. S is the standard deviation of the sample. Well, having collected the sample, we can work out its standard deviation. And N is just the sample size. So when we use this formula, we calculate the T score. The distribution of the T statistic is called a T distribution, or student's T distribution. If you're curious why it's called student's T distribution, uh, that may constitute a, a nice little research activity for you, perhaps to conduct online. Now, we need to come uh, deal with a concept called degrees of freedom. There are, are actually many different T distributions. So far, I've been talking about them like there has been there is one, but in fact, there are many. And the reason for that is, is quite simple. Um, the averages in populations may vary. So we can envisage different population distributions, all with different averages. We can also envisage uh, population distributions with different standard deviations, if you like, different spread. Some, some distributions very tight around the mean, some very loosely gathered around the mean. So there are many different types of distribution and there are also many different types of t-distribution. The particular form of the t-distribution is determined by its degrees of freedom. And let's see what's meant by degrees of freedom. This refers to the number of independent observations in a set of data, the number of independent ones. Um, if I said that the, the, the sample was made up from just three observations and I said that the, um, the numbers were 1, 2 and 3. So I've selected numbers 1, 2 and 3. Now, quite simply, the average here is 2. So if, if I've got the average at 2, and I now decide I don't know what the other numbers are for some reason, but I know what the average is, it's 2, then I've only got 2, well, 2 degrees of freedom. I can select the other number, one other number, but once I've selected it, the other number is fixed because I know what the average is, the average is 2. So degrees of freedom refers to the number of independent observations in a set of data. When estimating a mean score of a population from a single sample, the number of independent observations is equal to the sample size minus 1. So because the mean takes up one, mean means we lose a degree of freedom because we're told what the, the mean is. So we can't have any number. That number will determine the other numbers, or the at least it, it will fix the other numbers. So it must have that mean. And we can have a large number of other numbers, but one of them must be such so as to meet the constraint that the mean is the number that was fixed. So our score of, of a sample from uh, a single sample, the number of independent observations is equal to the sample size minus 1. Hence, the distribution of the t-statistic from a sample of size 8 will be described by a t-distribution having 8 minus 1, seven degrees of freedom. Now we haven't dealt, we haven't used degrees of freedom uh, so far, just this talk is just generally introducing the idea of degrees of freedom. That as I said, once one of these statistics is fixed, we're losing a degree of freedom. We could have 
two statistics fixed, in which case we lose two degrees of freedom. If we know what the, the mean is and we know what the standard deviation is, then we've got two degrees of freedom. So now the sample size will be n minus 2. The size of the sample, n minus 2. Because those two must be met. Now, properties of the t-distribution. Well, the mean of the distribution is equal to 0. So the average of the t-distribution is 0. The variance is equal to v over v minus 2, where v is the degrees of freedom. So the variance, in other words, the, the standard deviation squared, which is the variance, is equal to v over v minus 2. And of course, v is greater than or equal to 2. If it wasn't, the denominator on that expression would be either 0 or negative. Now, the variance is always greater than 1, although it is close to 1 when there are many degrees of freedom. So the variance of the sample, using the t-distribution, the, the variance of the sample is always greater uh, than 1. It's close to 1 uh, when there are many degrees of freedom. With infinite degrees of freedom, the t-distribution is the same as the standard normal distribution. That's if you have infinite degrees of freedom. You have to have a very, very large population. Um, then the t-distribution the is the same as the standard normal Now, when to use the t-distribution? Well, the t-distribution can be used with any statistic having a bell-shaped distribution. For example, approximately normal. The bell-shaped distribution is the normal distribution. So any distribution which is tends to be bell-shaped like that, then the t-distribution can be used. The sampling distribution of a statistic should be bell-shaped if any of the following conditions apply. If the population distribution is normal, then we would expect the, um, the sampling distribution to be, to be normal, especially if it's collected randomly and without bias. The population distribution is symmetric, unimodal, and without outliers and the sample size is at least 30. Now symmetric is what I explained earlier. If we fold the distribution across uh, at the mean, it will fall exactly on top of itself. It's symmetric. Unimodal, a single point, so it's bell-shaped, so there's one maximum value. Unimodal. And without outliers. Outliers are simply observations which cannot be accounted for. They're normally so far away from the, the rest of the distribution that they tend to be ignored. They're perhaps three or four standard deviations away from the, the mean, or, or even more. But these are called outliers. They're just observations that don't fit the pattern. And the sample size should be at least 30. So when we're conducting a sample, looking for 30 uh, fits in with the t-distribution, is what's required. The population distribution is moderately skewed, unimodal, without outliers, and the sample size is at least 40. So if it is mod moderately skewed, now skewed means uh, perhaps not fixed on the mean. It's it's slightly to the left or to the right. If the distribution is slightly away from the from where it should be, it, it's it's pointing in a slightly different direction. The distribution is, is not fitting our normal uh, distribution requirement. Uh, it, it might be just slightly skewed in some way. Perhaps one of the tails is longer than the other. So it's not really symmetric. 
it's skewed. Now, if it's not symmetric, uh, but however, it's unimodal, it's only got one point, and let's say it doesn't have any outliers. In this case, if the sample size is at least 40, that should compensate for it. So that tells us, again, what we should be looking for in terms of conducting a good uh, sampling uh, arrangement. If, if we're looking for a uh, sample from a population and we're trying to aim for uh, we don't not quite sure what the distribution is we hope it's symmetric and unimodal one point and it's bell shaped uh, if we conduct a conduct a sample of 40 drawn randomly from that population it should meet the requirements and then use the the t distribution The sample size is greater than 40 without outliers. So if it's greater than 40, say let's say 45, 50, a sample size of around 50, no outliers. In other words, no observations that can't be accounted for that lie off into the extremes, then the T distribution could be used again. The T distribution should not be used with small samples from populations that are not approximately normal. So the T distribution should not be used with small samples um, and also from populations that are not normal. So care should be taken when looking at the population to see if it is a normal distribution or if it tends to follow some normal pattern. And the best way to do that is by uh, arranging the data in a frequency diagram, looking at the frequency of certain observations to see if it fits some sort of normal pattern, if it's, if it's this bell-shaped pattern or roughly that bell-shaped pa pattern, and then draw an appropriate sample size, say 40, 45 or whatever it is, then use the T statistic. Now probability and the student t distribution. When a sample size of n is drawn from a population having a normal or nearly normal distribution, the sample mean can be transformed into a t statistic. So having drawn a sample from a population that is normal or nearly normal, and having drawn a good size sample, let's say as 40, 45, 50 even, uh, then it can be transformed into a t-statistic. And that's the formula for it. Uh, t equals the, uh, the, the sample mean minus the population mean over the, uh, the, o o over the, the sample size divided by the, the population square root of the population, where x is the mean, uh, mu is the population mean, s is the standard deviation of the sample, and n is the sample size. And the degrees of freedom are n minus 1, because the, the mean has been determined. Once the mean has been calculated, we lose a degree of freedom. The t-statistic produced by this transformation can be associated with a unique uh, cumulative probability. So if we can work out the t-statistic uh, using this formula and it meets those various requirements I've just called out, then it's possible to use that t-statistic to calculate cumulative probabilities. This cumulative prob probability represents the likelihood of finding a sample mean that is less than or equal to x given a random sample of size n. So it's quite a powerful uh, statistic. It can be used in a variety of computations and it can be relied upon to give reasonable approximations, very good approximations in fact, uh, towards the, the population 
characteristics. Let's take a problem. Assume that a company makes wooden blocks, say 20 centimetres wide, 20 centimetres high and 100 centimetres long. Now, the company makes these blocks, wooden blocks. Customers require the blocks to be 100 centimetres long. A quality test randomly selected um, 12, uh, sorry, 120 blocks for testing. The blocks had an average length of 99.5 with a standard deviation of 1.35 centimeters. That's what the, the, the sample has thrown up. What is the probability that a block will be 99.5 centimeters or less? So, if we pose it in, in a way that we can fit into our formula, we have x mu, mu is the population mean, s, the standard deviation of the sample, and n, the population size. So the, the quality test was based on 120 blocks for testing. Um, you can see how these fit together. Uh, just simply by matching them up. Now if we go to our calculation here and here's our formula again and this time we fit those figures in there then we get uh, a t value of minus 4.05 or minus 4.06 the probability, uh, the probable uh, probability of less than or equal to 99.5 is 0 0.0003 zeros 5883. If we just lim uh, label those for the moment, what we've got there is how we calculate it. We calculate it as C2 minus C3 all over C4 over the square root of C5. And that gives us this I3. Uh, the probability uh, of calculating it could have been done by simply uh, going to Excel and typing in t dot distribution or t dot dist bracket I3 14 true. So there's the I3, and what we need to do is to find out what's the population, what is the chances, or what are the chances of there being uh, 14 or less. So if we take that across, we would see here that the I3, that figure, uh, is off the the curve. It's if we take minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, probably minus 4, minus 4.05 is, is on to the left where the arrows are pointing. Now, suppose scores of an IQ test are normally distributed with a population mean of 100. Now, that would be our mu. Suppose 20 people are randomly selected and tested, the standard deviation in the sample group is 18, 18 equals S, and 20 people are selected, so 20 equals N. What is the probability that the average test score in the sample group will be at most 90? Well, the population uh, mean is 100. So what's the the chances that an average test score in the sample will be at most 90? So we can write it out straight away into this format and work out the t-statistic. And here we've found that the, the t-statistic is uh, minus 2.48 probability of less than or equal to 90 uh, is 
1.3%. That minus 2.48 is calculated using the formula, and that's how we would fit that into the formula. And of course, the t statistic there, we would just simply look up in tables of t statistics. Uh, there are tables. We would look across, find uh, 2.48, minus 2.48, and look at what the associated figures were. And the associated figure for this would be 1.3%. And there's another calculation just performed almost for the fun of it. This time, if the standard deviation is increased to 20, in the previous one he was just 18. And if the standard deviation is increased to 20, uh, we find that the number goes up to 2.1%, which is what we would expect. There is greater variation in, this, in the sample. It's gone up to 20, whereas the previous one was just 18. Uh, so we'd expect the um, probability of less than or equal to 90 to have increased. So that's a a talk on the student t distribution. It may sound complex and it may sound quite difficult. In fact, it's quite straightforward when we settle down and think about it with cool heads. It's worth going back over the video, making your own notes and doing some research. There are ample notes on the course on this topic and there's plenty of information online about this particular topic as well. So research it out and, and make sure that you have a clear understanding of what's meant by students' T distribution. But that's all we're going to deal with here, so let's leave it at that and say thank you for watching.